I'm going to tell you about the research I've been doing for the past two years with colleagues and friends. Uh, we've been studying the Jackman Canyon intrusive suite in the central Sierra Nevada. Um, and it has an interesting map pattern and w was largely undescribed up until now. And so we're going to explore this map pattern that's got this weird migration to it and also characterize the system. So here's our general game plan. We're going to start with some background terminology about plutons so everyone's read in. Think about why plutons are important, um, both at a societal and geologic level. Um, review a bit of a debate in the pluton community about chemistry and where plutons acquire their chemical signatures. And then dive into our setting uh, in the Sierra Nevada arc and uh, past studies of the Jack Main, which will help us identify our knowledge gaps and then we'll look at the methods we're going to use to fill those gaps, review the data sets, and develop some models in the discussion, and then put the Jack Main in a context in the Sierra Nevada and as a migrating system. So when you look up Pluton in the dictionary, Merriam-Webster spits back a typically large body of intrusive igneous rock. And you might be familiar with the Charles Lyell um, vat of liquid magma um, from 1838. Um, we've moved past that, and in this talk, when I talk about plutons, I'm talking about intrusive rocks with a coherent lithology. So if I go out in the field and I see this texture, I can map it in, within some variation. And then when I find a new lithology, I can put a line on the map where we change from different modal abundances or crystals or mineral phases. Um, we know that plutons are grown in increments. Um, this is just one visualization where we have individual diapirs adding up at the emplacement level to create a bigger pluton. You can also have multiple plutons which come together if they're coming from a common source as a cogenetic suite, or if you have non-cogenetic pulses from different sources accumulating together, you get a complex, and these can grow over up to 10 million years. Um, and on a bigger scale, throughout the crust, we want to think about these plutons as the Earth's um, attempt to differentiate mantle heat by um, sending up these plutons that carry mass and heat into the crust and eventually lead to some eruption, but mostly we're stalling out these plutons in the crust. So that's how we want to think about these bodies that we're going to look at. And we study these plutons for a number of reasons. Um, they have, of course, the association with volcanism. This is just from last week in Russia, an arc volcano went off Rykoke, um, and its plume, beautifully shown here, is entering the stratosphere, which is concerning. Um, then arc plutons in particular are also associated with copper, molybdenum, and gold porphyry deposits. So in this schematic, we can see the top of a pluton and the uh, metal-enriched fluids coming off at the volcanic plutonic interface, creating these porphyry deposits. So in that sense, chemical evolution of these arc plutons is curious and important to us. Um, plutons also provide great material to form cratons. And also, when you build an arc, you create a mountain chain that can be eroded to create sediments. So these are key in developing our continents. Um, and then the last thing is uh, that volcanic outgassing and also intersection of arcs with carbonate platforms, especially here in the Mesozoic. We can see the Atlantic opening. And we have all these arcs intersecting continental carbonate platforms. And that signal can be picked up in um, the climate record as well. So these are the reasons we think about plutons beyond just understanding them and how they develop. So now let's, let's learn about this debate. So the question is, where do plutons acquire their chemical signature? And the two end members we're going to be working within are a source region model, where we have all the activity happening in the lower crustal source hot zones. And those magmas are then brought up to the emplacement level. They don't acquire any new chemical signatures at the emplacement level that dominate. It's mostly just this, this source region control. Or alternatively, we have plutons that act as a bit of a mush ladder, where as you add more plutons to the crust, you create this um, entirely extensive um, mush system where you can have uh, crystalline outer uh, mush with liquid-rich interiors, and you can add new magmas that pass along this and might pick up signals, chemical signals from different tiers before they get to their final emplacement level. And so 
these are two extremes, but nature doesn't really like to work with extreme end members. So we're going to assume that there's a bit of a blend. Um, the question then is, how do we know which is driving the chemistry of a given pluton? The source or the, the system within it. So if we would have just one system fractionating inward determining the chemistry, that would be the other end member. Um, so now that we have a sense of how plutons are working and uh, some open questions about how they work, um, let's get into our setting. So here we have California, we have the, in blue the Sierra Nevada Batholith, and this figure from Chapman and Ducha. We're seeing that if we look at the early Cretaceous red dots, we see that magmatism is moving inboard from east to west, or from west to east. So we have an arc-wide trend where magmatism is moving inboard. Then in, when we zoom into the central Sierras where the Jack Main is intruded in the Lake Cretaceous, here we are again, Batholith, our locality in this map to the right. We have uh, recently heard from Katie Ardell at USC that the rocks in the central Sierra get younger towards a specific point in the Tuolumne intrusive complex. So on this color-coded map, we have lighter colors indicating older, going to dark, younger. So if we look down here, we have lighter, going to darker, lighter, going to darker. So we have a regional pattern where intrusive rocks, and also volcanic and hypobyssal rocks are getting younger to this area, and we have this arc scale pattern. And so this focusing to get a little deeper into it, it's this preferential organization of intruding magmas over time. And we have a specific region where the youngest rocks are found, this white circle. And then if we think about this in cross-section, throughout the crust, it might be, Katie suggests, that we have this uh, incremental constriction of where we're putting magma. And when we're in the central Sierras, we're looking at a slice through here in map view in the upper crust. And above it, presumably, would have been a focused volcanic field, something that's been documented multiple times around the world. So again, we're, we're slicing through here, and we get a map view like this. Now, there's something that stands out on this map. Uh, this set of bodies, it's got a very dark color set against light color, suggests, indicating that it is much younger than the rock around it. And this is actually uh, the Jack Main Canyon intrusive suite. And so we'll actually see that the map pattern suggests it's younging this way, antithetical to the focusing in this direction and the west to east migration. So we have this curious system. Let's see what we know about it. So again, up here, for reference, this is where we are in this figure. This is the original geologic map of the Jack Main. And it was originally mapped by Hubert all in 1989 as a suite of cogenetic plutons. The first one is uh, this KGI down here. It has two faces. They're not shown in, in this map, but they're mapped by the person who did the quadrangle mapping there. Then that's followed by the KBU, which we have a sliver of here and then a body down here, followed by the KLV, which is a granodiorite. KBU and KLV are both granodiorites, followed by the last unit, KBL, this uh, granodiorite to granite unit. So these are cogenetic based on the mapping. Turns out there uh, is only one other study of these rocks. Um, another master's thesis by Brent Turin in 1984. Um, it, he used potassium argon closure ages of biotite and hornblende to look at the thermal history of the KGI, KBU, and KLV. And he found that in general they young to the northwest along tracking with uh, cross-cutting relationships. But he also acknowledges that this big dark body, the Tuolumne, um, likely overprinted some of the thermal ages. So it's not necessarily representative. So that's what we know about this system. So we can say that our first um, and biggest knowledge gap is that the system is relatively undescribed. So our first goal is to characterize it and develop a, an idea or a model for how it uh, evolved. Then we have this dynamic setting that the Jack Main intruded into with this migration and this regional focusing. So what does the Jack Main's presence mean in, the, in this context? So we're going to explore that. And then there's this migrating map pattern. So first we need to confirm that it happened, that it actually migrated, and things young to the northwest. And then we're going to explore that concept. Um, and then the last thing we're going to do is see if we can leverage the system to give us new insights about 
this petrogenetic debate about where chemistry is set. So here are the data sets we're going to use. Um, these are not all this, the data we collected for this study, but this is what we have time for, and these are really the highlights. So we're going to use the mapping, zircon ages from these units to test that migration idea. We're going to look in petrography <coughs> at plagioclase and hornblende because I think they play the most um, important role in the chemistry of these units, and then we're going to tie that into whole rock major and trace elements and develop it into a model. So. Let's start in the field and go through the big findings. Uh, most important uh, lithologic finding was that we added a sixth lithology. So down here, this is the KBLT transitional unit, and it's different from the inner KBL in that it has more biotite in a fine grain population, but also these larger biotite crystals. And then you tra transition to uh, low biotite content in the inner KBL, and it's actually got more muscovite than biotite. It's a two mica granite. Um, then we also observed diverse and abundant magmatic structures, uh, mostly in KBU, KLV, and KBLT. So just running through a few of these, we have up here, you might have heard of ladder dikes. You can see these rungs, these curved features. We have one coming up this way, being truncated by another. We have magmatic folds. We have Schlieren accumulations interacting with host rock, uh, host magma, forming these tendrils. Um, in high melt situations, high melt content situations in a magma, you can get fluvial density, fluvial-like density sorting of uh, mafix and dense accessory phases, creating these bands. And you can see repeated bands suggesting that we had a flow down in this direction, um, and those. Uh, can be mapped out throughout uh, the KBLT really well. We also see evidence of magmatic faulting, so we have this uh, dark horizon here. It gets truncated up to here, or down from here, rather. Um, here we have mafic, min uh, mafic magmas mingling um, with host magmas, and then this is perhaps a plume head, so you have a rising buoyant um, plume within, just locally within the magma mush. And after it stalled, you would have had right here the host magma reintruding it. So the takeaway here is that we have lots of movement and a dynamic magma mush in different units. So one of the most powerful data sets that we collect out in the field are our foliation measurements. The Jack Main has local subsolidus foliations, so we see that in this photo. Um, but then there are also four magmatic foliations, alignments of minerals, uh, by stress when the magma was active and it had liquid content. And there are four foliations throughout the Jack Main. The first one are local ones defined by those structures we just looked at, so you wouldn't map those out on a, on a big map. But then we have ones that pervade multiple units, so we have margin parallel fabrics and two regional fabrics um, that we're going to look at on the map in a second. And we can see that often uh, mafic enclaves and stoke blocks can be aligned to these fabrics and help us find them when the plane is a little tricky to see. Also, up here we see with the red dashed line and the pencil, they're showing two different fabrics in one rock. So you can pick out some horn blends that are aligned along this uh, more vertical on the, on the screen here fabric and then some that are aligned to the, the other one. So when you can find both, then you can know that there's multiple strains being re reflected in the rock, and we can measure that and show it on the map. And then the most consequential observations we made in the field are related to gradational contacts. The original map has only sharp contacts, um, so we're going to look at that in a second. And then also, we revised the extents of different units. Um, so here is the map that we submitted for publication. We're going to look at simpler figures in a second, but I just want to draw some comparisons to the old map. We're going to start with Kibbe Lake here as a visual anchor. Over here, it's on the edge of the KBL, and over here, we actually see it's at the edge of the inner KBL, and then it's uh, got this stippled transitional unit around it, and then we even have KLV all the way past it, enveloping it and we bring it all the way down and around to get this nested pattern, we see that that's missing here. So that's the major change to the extent of the units. Um, the other thing I want to point out on this figure 
uh, are the foliation measurements. So in blue, if you can tell the difference, those are USGS foliations often in the host rock that I compiled from quadrangle maps. And then in black, we have our transects um, with our measurements. And you can see sometimes we have two different strikes on a given station. That's those situations where you have two fabrics in one, one rock. Um, so let's look at some simpler figures. So for this map, we want to look at uh, a pattern in the uh, contacts. In the early units, KGIF, KGIC, and KBU, we have these solid line, sharp contacts between the units. And then as we transition to KBU, KLV, we start to get these dashed gradational contacts. And then as we move to this contact, it's more pervasive. We get sharp on the periphery, but then still this large gradational contact, and then the inner KBL appears to be an entirely gradational contact with the KBLT. Now, the other thing we can do with foliations is connect the dots, and we can take stations along strike and draw these interpolated um, uh, fabric patterns. So this is a bit of a loud figure, but uh, we're going to focus on the blue, the red, and the black um, fabric. So Red is our east-west striking regional fabric. Blue is northwest-southeast regional. And black is margin parallel. So starting again in the early units, we have these margin parallel fabrics. We notice they actually are discordant when they get to contact. So down here, we can see this coming down, discordant with the coarse grain facies. Follow this one up, and it's almost perpendicular with the KBU contact. Then when we go to the gradational contacts, we see that in, from KBU to KLV, we actually have concordant patterns. And then up here, KBLT to KBL, we see regional and margin parallel um, fabrics crossing these contacts, suggesting that across these contacts, the magmas of different compositions are recording the same final strain. So now we've looked at the important field results. Let's shift gears to the lab. And let's start by checking this migration story. So over here we have ages from every unit, at least one. Starting with KGI, going to KBL, we see that the units do in fact get younger. And that's based on our calculated uh, weighted mean ages. And it looks like we're getting about three and a half million years of zircon growth in these samples. Um, however, you'll see, you see that we have three samples from the KLV, and they show from about 95.5 to 96.7 MA over a million years of crystallization if we use these weighted mean ages. Um, so if we had more samples, perhaps we would see longer crystallization histories within units and also perhaps for the sweet. Um, so these are more reconnaissance. But they do confirm that we're getting younger from southeast to northwest. Um, another important observation on this plot is that in KLV and KBL, we have very young ages ranging up to very old ages, whereas in older units, we have more restricted uh, age ranges. So we start having broader ages, maybe suggesting more longer periods of crystallization um, in the younger units. Um, so now let's shift to petrography. And we're, as I said, we're going to focus on plage and hornblende um, because I think they're most telling. And so starting with plage, there are three populations that exist in different abundances across every unit in the jack main. Uh, we have zoned grains, like this oscillatory zoned grain. You can see the nice gro growth rings. Unzoned grains, so here we have some little euhedral grains and interstitial ones that are unzoned. And then we have these ones with inclusions in their cores. And these cores are resorbed. We can see over here these dark uh, spots. If you zoom in, you start to see that you have bits of mafix, like biotite, but also accessory minerals in these cores. And uh, what I like about this figure is that we have this population juxtaposed with a zoned grain. Now, textures on a first order level are recording crystallization conditions. So when we have two different textures right next to each other, that's already implying that we have something funky going on. Um, and it turns out that we're going to make the inclusion bearing uh, population the star of the show because it turns out that that population is abundant in the two KGI facies, but then drops off in the KBU. 
in abundance and is generally sparse from there on out. And uh, not coincidentally, in the KBU, we see our first euhedral horn blends. And they actually have cores and they are oscillatory zones. So we have um, nice brown to olive to brown to blue-green growths. And the blue-green growths grow over these embayments on these cores. And um, we're going to find that to be uh, telling of um, some mineralogy in the source magmas later. But the important thing is that we're getting these euhedral grains as we lose these inclusion-bearing plagioclase grains. And it turns out, ooh, that's not pretty. Um, so that's just another uh, embayed. So we can sort of see embayments here uh, in KBU grain. But in KLV, we actually get slightly larger horn blends like this, also with embayments. But they're larger because they have thicker blue-green overgrowths. Um, and then as we move from KLV to the KBLT, the units it is in gradational contact with, uh, there's horn blends sprinkled around the rim of the unit, but then it disappears very quickly and you lose the horn blend. Um, so now we've, we've established these patterns in plagiarism and horn blend. We should be expecting them in chemistry. So let's move to uh, first XRF data for major elements. So we wanted to, to characterize the system. So we'll start with some classification. Um, over here, this uh, color-coded legend is going to stick with, with us throughout this section. Um, up here, we see in our aluminum saturation index, we're going from metaluminous to paraluminous throughout the suite, and the interface is at the KBU-KLV boundary, which is going to be a common theme for this section. Then we can see that the Jack main follows a calc alkaline series that's cont uh, continuously evolving, and that's um, pretty typical of Central Sierra or Sierra felsic plutons in general. If we look at um, typical compatible elements, we get these negative trends. Um, and then if we look at positive or at uh, incompatible elements, we get positive correlations. Now I'm focusing on this sodium plot because it also shows us another thing that we see in major and trace elements in Jack main chemistry. We have early units, KGI, facies, and KBU. They form these clusters alone and they don't overlap much. And then we go to KLV and KBLT and they form this cloud with uh, less of a trend and more overlap. And then KBL kind of breaks away on its own. So to get at some of these patterns, we can use trace elements. And we're going to use the rare earth elements in this talk. Um, so this is just a, a plot of all of the rare earth element samples we analyzed, um, normalized against chondrite val values. And what jumps out at us is the distance between the highest concentration and lowest concentration in the heavy rare earths. And we can see that the light rare earths are not as fractionated. And we really, starting with samarium, so middle and heavy rare earths, we start to see different units uh, parse out from one another. Um, the other thing that I want to mention while we're here is that we have uh, these dips in europium, these negative europium anomalies. We would usually expect this line to continue down and have concentrations of europium up here, but it's dipping down. And we're going to relate that to plagioclase crystallization now. So we're going to look at these units in pairs to get a sense of the change a little better. So we notice that we have these negative europium anomalies in the KGI units. So there's only one mineral that really soaks in europium, and that's plagioclase. And when you are missing europium, we can imply or infer that we are missing plagioclase. So part of the liquids that resulted in this final rock uh, were previously in equilibrium with plagioclase grains that are no longer there. So these units are missing plagioclase. Um, as we move to KBU and KLV, we can see in purple, KBU has these negative dips. Um, KLV, they get kind of softer. And then in some KLV samples, it's a little hard to see, but it looks like they're not even there anymore. And then when we go to KBLT, we see similar to KLV, these flat um, lines missing that anomaly. And then in red, KBL, a, a strong negative anomaly again, which is curious because we had just been smoothing over this anomaly. Um, also notice in red, the KBL is generally more enriched in rare earths across the board compared to the KBLT. 
So these, these plots are a little loud, and so we're going to focus in on this europium anomaly um, in bivariate space because it's a little clearer. So just to go over it, europium on the top is our measured europium divided by the europium we should have. So a negative anomaly would be below 1, and then a positive anomaly would be above. So we notice that all samples, except for maybe one, um, are negative anomalies. But there's a pattern here. So early units, again, clustering on their own, as they do, um, they have negative anomalies between 0.7 and 0.8. And then in KLV and one KBU sample, actually, we start uh, having less and less negative anomalies. And then KLV and KBLT, again, clustering together. Um, so relating this back to plagioclase, that means as we go from KBU to KLV, we're starting to have less missing plagioclase. And then in the KBL, we actually have the most negative anomalies, suggesting we've lost the most plagioclase. So that's a curious situation we'll get to later. But right now, focusing on these early units, missing more plage, and then less and less um, plage. So if you haven't guessed it, we're going to relate something else in these trace elements to our horn blend, because we looked at that in petrography. So similar to europium anomaly, we have something called a dysprosium anomaly. And as you have a lower dysprosium anomaly, you have had more horn blend fractionation. So we see this bimodal distribution of those early units, again, forming a cluster. And then between KBU and KLV, we transition to more horn blend fractionated. Um, the last trace element um, indicator we're going to use is lanthanum over ytterbium which uh, tracks hornblende as well because ytterbium goes into hornblende readily. So as you crystallize hornblende, you draw ytterbium down and you would jack up this ratio. So we see a shallow positive trend maybe in early units and then the spike in KLV and KBLT. And then a, a reversal actually in KBL, which is curious. And we can see by just plotting a terbium that we get this kink as well. And so we know that it's actually a terbium causing that ratio to change like that. And then we actually enrich in a terbium uh, in KBL. All right, so we've gone over the data, some interpretations, um, and then relate those interpretations to a physical and petrologic model. And then we'll compare to the uh, Central Sierra Plutons and then also think about migration a little. So developing a physical model. Um, the key evidence I want to lean on here is this shift from sharp to gradational contacts. I think what we're seeing is that as we g follow migration, we start developing longer and longer lived mush systems. So between KLV and KBU, we start to couple these units. And they're both magmas at the same time. Um, and early units because they have uh, these truncations and these sharp contacts and also discordant fabrics, I'm going to infer that they were originally ellipsoidal and then were cut, they cut one another. And then as you shift to um, these younger units, they start to nest more. And so we can think again about these discordant fabrics um, suggesting that these were not magmas at the same time and then the concordant fabrics recording that they're showing the same strain, strain, they're both magmas at the same time, and this becomes more of a theme in these younger units, signaling that we have this longer-lived system. Um, and then relating back magmatic structures, which really show up in KBU, KLV, and KBLT, these are recording that we are getting local flow um, of crystals and melt throughout the system, which is uh, permissive of this longer-lived magma mush. So if we wanted to visualize this, um, I've got uh, these inferred ellipsoidal shapes, and then the center of the ellipsoid just tracked so that we can see the change through time. So KGIF would come in as an ellipsoid, KGIC would truncate it, and then KBU would truncate that, and we can see how much we've cut through with these center pieces. Um, and then KLV actually starts to nest more. It, it moves more along this migration, but notice how much of KBU is gone and actually choose back into KGIC, which is um, really astounding, I think. And then you have KBLT come in mostly within the 
Lake Vernon, the KLV, and then KBL within that. So we go from migration to more of a nesting pattern. So we can actually start to see some of this longer lived magma mush activity in the zircon record too. Um, so um, we could argue that these increasing rain ranges and ages in each sample signal that you're crystallizing zircon over a longer period of time. Alternatively, some of these ages link up with older units, and we just saw that these units are scouring into one another, potentially incorporating more material from early units. So maybe those are recycled ages, antichrists, that are transferred over and just keep growing. Um, or it's the co-magmatic activity. We just also saw that the fabrics suggest that in these younger units, they're active for longer and active together with neighboring units. But as we said at the beginning, extremes are not really how nature works. And we have field evidence for both long-lived growth and recycling. So I think it's probably a blend and uh, uh, an in-depth geochronology study could really get at that better. Um, but uh, I think we, we do need a blend of both here. And moving to chemistry, uh, I want to argue that based on uh, the way that early units cluster on their own and KLV and KBLT cluster together, we move from isolated magmas that um, don't interact much at the emplacement level to more hybridized magmas in the KLV and KBLT. And this fits with our, our field mapping as well, the, our field um, physical model, where we get this increased uh, truncation and recycling of these units. Um, so early units likely grew as isolated um, systems, KLV and KBLT, more, of, more hybrids of new melts coming in but mixing with what's there. So it turns out that I also think we see um, a signal from the source in our petrography and um, chemistry. So starting with petrography, here's just another example of uh, these inclusion-rich resorb core plagioclase, two of them together. Um, I think that chemistry and petrography in this system track the onset of plagioclase suppression in the source and the stabilization of hornblende. So uh, many studies have documented that as you add hydrous basalt to the lower crust, you add more water content than plagioclase is comfortable with. So early magmas might be in drier, um, sort of gabbroic situations where they can crystallize lots of plag. Um, and then as you add more water, you stabilize hornblende and you lose the plag. And so these early um, units, specifically KGI, that has a lot of these inclusion-rich um, plage grains, I think those are grains coming potentially from the source or from below the emplacement level and surviving emplacement. And then as you start crystallizing more hornblende in the source, we start to get hornblende in the KBU, not necessarily dominating yet. We transition because, remember, KBU and KGI, they both have missing plage because of those europium anomalies. But, ooh, yikes, um, we start to see this hornblende. And then in KLV, I think we see more of this hornblende, but potentially also transferred hornblende that keeps growing because we have these thicker overgrowth rooms. Um, so maybe a little bit of uh, source hornblende, but also recycled hornblende in the KLV. And remember, we, we lose all that hornblende in the KBLT. Um, so here's how the, we relate this back to the europium anomalies. We have missing plage early on, which is consistent with having plage in the source abundantly. And then as you suppress plagioclase growth more and more, there's fewer grains to soak up the europium and it makes it up to the rising magmas and so you get um, less missing europium. Um, I think dysprosium and lanthanum over ytterbium show us this as well. Early units have uh, less sign of, uh, a lower sign of hornblende fractionation. And these younger units are more hornblende fractionated. And we know that there has to be a blend of hybridizing what's at the emplacement level with the new magmas because we have this shift from KBU to KLV. It's not a jump. We're adding these KLV magmas that have lost hornblende at the source with what's at the emplacement level and we smooth up to the steep trend. Um, and now let's, let's talk about the KBL because I've neglected it. And it has this weird thing where it breaks from all the patterns and reverses them. Um, 
I'm going to argue that uh, KBL is actually fractionated from the surrounding KBLT um, as a set of mostly liquids that are forced inwards during solidification. And I'm going to argue that because we have these europium anomalies and the enriched rare earth elements. Remember, there's no horn blend in the inner KBLT, and it's grading towards granite, and then it hits this 2 microgranite. Um, because there's no horn blend, there's nowhere to put these uh, middle and heavy rare earth elements that it soaks up. So if there's no mineral phase in the magma to soak up these elements, they're going to stay in the melt. And then you're going to end up enriching the, the partial melt in rare earths. And uh, when we see this europium anomaly, I've been leaning on a source story for europium anomaly, missing plage in the source. The problem is uh, we have this dysprosium anomaly telling us that hormolin is still fractionating in the source. And uh, thus we probably don't have plagioclase, but we need to lose plagioclase somewhere. And there's plenty of plagioclase in the KBLT mush around the KBL. So if you just remove the melts from the mush, you are leaving behind plage that has europium, and you're enriched in rare earth elements, as we see in the, in the data. So I've just made a lot of uh, interpretations, especially about the source and how it changes. And it turns out that we can link this to the rock record. I think this is important to me. Um, and it turns out that we can look for a plagioclase rich and hornblende poor source for KGI units, and some of Diane's work actually um, details rocks that fit this description. So these uh, gabbros at Summit Mountain um, have plage and pyroxene and not hornblende. Whereas then when you transition to a, a source that has hornblende and plage, uh, we could lean on something like the Onion Valley hornblende gabbros that Tom Sisson described. Um, then, continuing for KLV and KBLT, we need horn blend fractionation to continue. And there are a number of ways you can do this with garnet clinoperoxenites that have been erupted out of um, volcanic centers since the arc was active that record um, plenty of clinopyroxene, which you can form by replacing horn blend um, and still get this horn blend signal. Um, and if you're interested in that, um, Diane, maybe, Smith 2014 discusses that. Um, and then uh, essentially we have good rock record evidence that these source changes are viable, uh, the source changes I'm reading out of these uh, different data sets. So to summarize the geochemical evolution, we have three stages. Um, KGI and KBU units form as isolated systems that mostly don't hybridize at the emplacement level. KLV and KBLT are horn blend fractionated at the source melts that rise up and intrude into uh, magmas already at the emplacement level. And so are hybrids between source melts and emplacement level magmas. And then KBL forms strictly or largely by inward solidification and melt fractionation from KBLT. So let's relate this back quickly to the petrogenetic debate. Mostly source control in stage one, a blend of uh, source and emplacement level in the second stage, and mostly system pluton control in the last stage. And we know that uh, this can work with the source signals and the rock record. Now let's relate it to the physical model. Um, negligible upper crustal hybridization in early stages. This works with our discordant fabrics and our sharp contacts. Um, our uh, hybridized units, this works with our gradational contacts, all of our flow and recycling structures, and the heavy removal of, of those units. And then fractionating of KBL from KBLT, this fits with the gradation throughout those two phases and the gradational contact. So our physical model and our petrologic model mesh. So now let's zoom out and think about the Jack Main in the central Sierra Nevada context. So it turns out this transition from quartz diorite to granite is a typical pattern in the central Sierra Nevada. Uh, Bateman compiled um, a lot of, I think pretty much he is, he, his paper in 1992 is referred to as the Bible of um, central Sierra Nevada plutonism and this calc alkaline trend, this lithologic sequence, these are typical. 
if we look at the zircon record, we have incremental growth, we have zircon recycling um, across contacts. This is also typical of central Sierra Nevada systems. Same with magmatic flow and recycling structures. These both zircon and structures were just documented recently in the neighboring Tuolumne. Um, and then the four magmatic foliations also present in the Tuolumne and suggesting the Jack Main is reflecting a typical central Sierra Nevada strain history. So the only thing that's different about the system is this weird map pattern. Um, so let's think about that. We have, again, regional focusing to this area, arc migration all across the arc in that direction. But Jack Main is kind of tearing off on its own and it's pretty small and local. And so based on that, I think that it is not something being controlled on an arc scale or even a focusing scale. I think, um, so there's actually a, a paper reviewing or acknowledging migrating and asymmetrical systems. And um, it was really the only paper about migrating systems. And they proposed that maybe migrating systems reflect a tectonic control. Um, but the Jack Main breaks from all the patterns that they relate to that as well. So um, I'm inferring that maybe a local cause could explain the migration. One possibility that I uh, came up with is that you have a blockage in your conduit where the first unit reaches the emplacement level. It freezes too quickly, which works with our discordant contacts um, and our limited zircon crystallization and all of the other things we mentioned. And then the next pulse stalls underneath and it needs to move out from under that pulse laterally. Um, this has been documented in other systems. Um, the problem is that it doesn't explain why it would keep doing it the same direction. Um, a possibility is that it's a positive feedback where you just open this conduit continuously in the same direction, but this is really speculation and um, something that we might want to model in the future, and more geochronology could help us figure that out. Um, so here's a figure that Allie drafted very kindly um, for this presentation where we might see um, these pulses sort of flow to the northwest out from underneath one another. And then as we shift to more nesting, we reuse the conduit more and more and then the KBL forming as a fraction on the inside. All right, so we made it through. Um, let's review what we've learned. Uh, the Jack Main is proposed to have three physical and petrologic stages. They're linked and heavily intertwined. Um, and the field and lab data both uh, support this. We have compositional control that seems to swing from the source to the system. We have uh, a number of different avenues of investigation that lead us to the conclusion Jack Main is very typical for the Central Sierra Nevada, just not its weird migration. Uh, and then we think migration might be controlled locally, not by far field processes, but there's a lot of open questions there. But it did happen. And then uh, this study is really just another testament to the idea that you want to combine field constraints and petrologic constraints. Um, looking at just one would be foolish and you might not see the whole picture. Um, and we have this debate that might be better informed if we think about this blend of uh, source versus system rather than relying on just one model. Um, and the trick is to parse when which is controlling the system. So uh, I'd like to thank some people, uh, specifically first funding, EDMAP um, and NSF to Valley um, led to two months of mapping um, I have to thank the Patterson Group at USC for discussions about the system and other systems, and then all the people who are involved. So quickly, Jamie, she couldn't be here today, but and we didn't really talk about her work. She did a study of just the KLV, and uh, her findings really influenced how I think about textural um, diversity just within one system. Um, then I have to thank my family and friends on the East Coast for putting up with me not being there. Um, and then uh, I'd like to thank the Mimeti Lab Group for support supporting me through this. And then also, Diane, thank you for uh, showing me the dark side of the arc. Here's Diane with... Yeah, thank you for showing that picture. I, 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 it's, it's the only one I could find. 
Um, yeah, without, without your class, I don't think I would have uh, seen the data the way that I did. Um, and then, uh, of course, Ali, from day one, when we had the llamas and the poop break, um, the llamas were already not behaving. Uh, I don't think this project wouldn't have been possible without you. Um, Valley, thank you for handing me this project and letting me just do everything. <laughs> um, and then lastly, thank you to the committee. Hi, Natalie. Um, for listening to me and, and giving me um, feedback. So yeah. And then we got some references. Do we have any questions?